You have fed upon my seigneuries, disparked my parks, and felled my forest woods, from mine own windows torn my household coat, raised out my impress, leaving me no sign, save men's opinions and my living blood, to show the world I am a gentleman. Richard II When the boat which carried the worthy captain on board his vessel had accomplished the task, the sails began to ascend, and the ship was got under way. She fired three guns as a salute to the house of Elangoan, and then shot away rapidly before the wind, which blew offshore, under all the sail she could crowd. I, I, said the laird, who had sought mannering for some time, and now joined him, there they go, there go the free traders, there go Captain Dirk Hatterick, and the young Frau Hagenslapen, half Manx, half Dutchman, half Devil. Run off the bowsprit, up mainsail, top and top gallant sails, royals, and skyscrapers, and away, follow who can. That fellow, Mr. Mannering, is the terror of all the excise and custom house cruisers, they can make nothing of him, he drubs them, or he distances them, and, speaking of excise, I come to bring you to breakfast, and you shall have some tea, that. Mannering, by this time, was aware that one thought linked strangely on to another in the concatenation of worthy Mr. Bertram's ideas. Like orient pearls at random strung. And, therefore, before the current of his associations had drifted farther from the point he had left, he brought him back by some inquiry about Dirk Hatterake. Oh, he's a the good sort of blackguard fellow enough, nobody cares to trouble him, the smuggler, when his guns are in ballast, privateer, or pirate faith, when he gets them mounted. He has done more mischief to the revenue folk than any rogue that ever came out of Ramsey. But, my good sir, such being his character, I wonder he has any protection and encouragement on this coast. Why, Mr. Mannering, people must have brandy and tea, and there's none in the country but what comes this way, and then there's short accounts, and maybe a keg or two, or a dozen pounds left at your stable door, instead of a D.D. Lang account at Christmas from Duncan Robb, the grocer at Kippel Tringen, who as I assume to make up, and either wants ready money, or a short-dated bill. Now, Hatterake will take wood, or he'll take bark, or he'll take barley, or he'll take just what's convenient at the time. I'll tell you a good story about that. There was Ansa Laird, that's MacPhee of Gudgeonford, he had a great number of cane hens, that's hens that the tenant pays to the landlord, like a sort of rent in kind, they I feed mine very ill, Lucky finished and sent up three that were ashamed to be seen only last week, and yet she has twelve bows, asterisk bulls, a large measure of grain, sowing a victual. Indeed her goodman, Duncan Finiston, that's him that's gone, we must all die, Mr. Mannering, that's our true, and speaking of that, let us live. In the meanwhile, for here's breakfast on the table, and the Domini ready to say the grace. The Domini did accordingly pronounce a benediction, that exceeded in length any speech which Mannering had yet heard him utter. The tea, which of course belonged to the noble Captain Hatterake's trade, was pronounced excellent. Still Mannering hinted, though with due delicacy, at the risk of encouraging such desperate characters, were it but injustice to the revenue, I should have supposed. Ah, the revenue lads, for Mr. Bertram never embraced a general or abstract idea, and his notion of the revenue was personified in the commissioners, surveyors, controllers, and writing officers, whom he happened to know, the revenue lads can look sharp enough out for themselves, no one needs to help them, and they have of the soldiers to assist them besides, and as to justice, you'll be surprised to hear it, Mr. Mannering, but I am not a justice of peace. Mannering assumed the expected look of surprise, but thought within himself that the worshipful bench suffered no great deprivation from wanting the assistance of his good-humoured landlord. Mr. Bertram had now hit upon one of the few subjects on which he felt sore, and went on with some energy. No, sir, the name of Godfrey Bertram of Elangoan is not in the last commission, though there's scarce a carl in the country that has a plowgate of land, but what he must ride to quarter sessions, and write J.P. after his name. I ken foo will whom I am obliged to the Sir Thomas Kittlecourt as good as told me he would sit in my skirts, if he had not my interest at the last election, and because I chose to go with my own blood and third cousin, the Laird of Balruddery, they keep it me off the roll of freeholders, and now there comes a new nomination of justices, and I am left out. And whereas they pretend it was because I let David MacGuffick, the constable, draw the warrants, and manage the business his eingate, 
asterisk own way, as if I had been a nose of wax, it's a main untruth, for I granted but seven warrants in my life, and the dominie wrote every one of them, and if it had not been that unlucky business of Sandy Macruthers, that the constables should have keep it TWA or three days up yonder at the old castle, just till they could get conveniency to send him to the county jail, and that cost me enough osiller, but I can what Sir Thomas wants very well, it was just sick and sick like about the seat in the Kirk of Kilmagirdle, was I not entitled to have the front gallery facing the minister, rather than Macroski of Creoxstone, the son of Deacon Macroski, the Dumfries weaver? Mannering expressed his acquiescence in the justice of these various complaints. And then, Mr. Mannering, there was the story about the road, and the full dyke, I ken Sir Thomas was behind there, and I said plainly to the clerk to the trustees that I saw the cloven foot, let them take that as they liked it, would any gentleman, or set of gentlemen, go and drive a road right through the corner of a full dyke, and take away, as my agent observed to them, like TWA roods of Goodmoreland pasture? And there was the story about choosing the collector of the cess. Certainly, sir, it is hard you should meet with any neglect in a country, where, to judge from the extent of their residence, your ancestors must have made a very important figure. Very true, Mr. Mannering, I am a plain man, and do not dwell on these things, and I must needs say, I have little memory for them, but I wish she could have heard my father's stories about the old fights of the MacDingaways, that's the Bertrams that now is why the Irish, and why the Highlanders, that came here in their burlings from Islay and Cantyre, and how they went to the Holy Land that is, to Jerusalem and Jericho, why are their clan at their heels, they had better have gained to Jamaica, like Sir Thomas Kittlecourt's uncle, and how they brought hame relics, like those that Catholics have, and a flag that's up yonder in the garret, if they had been casks of Muscovado, and puncheons of rum, it would have been better for the estate at this day, but there's little comparison between the old keep at Kittlecourt and the castle of Alangoan, I doubt if the keep's forty feet of front, but ye make no breakfast, Mr. Mannering, yeary no eating your meat. Allow me to recommend some of the kipper. It was John Hay that catched it, Saturday was three weeks, down at the stream below Hempseed Ford, etc., etc., etc. The laird, whose indignation had for some time kept him pretty steady to one topic, now launched forth into his usual roving style of conversation, which gave Mannering ample time to reflect upon the disadvantages attending the situation, which, an hour before, he had thought worthy of so much envy. Here was a country gentleman, whose most estimable quality seemed his perfect good nature, secretly fretting himself and murmuring against others, for causes which, compared with any real evil in life, must weigh like dust in the balance. But such is the equal distribution of providence. To those who lie out of the road of great afflictions, are assigned petty vexations, which answer all the purpose of disturbing their serenity, and every reader must have observed that neither natural apathy nor acquired philosophy can render country gentlemen insensible to the grievances which occur at elections, quarter sessions, and meetings of trustees. Curious to investigate the manners of the country mannering took the advantage of a pause in good Mr. Bertram's string of stories, to inquire what Captain Hatterick so earnestly wanted with the gypsy woman. Oh, to bless his ship, I suppose. You must know, Mr. Mannering, that these free traders, whom the law call smugglers, having no religion, make it all up in superstition, and they have as many spells, and charms, and nonsense. Vanity and war, said the dominie, it is a trafficking with the evil one. Spells, periaps, and charms, are of his device, choice arrows out of Apollyon's quiver. Hold your peace, dominie, Geary speaking forever. By the way they were the first words the poor man had uttered that morning, excepting that he had said grace, and returned thanks, Mr. Mannering cannot get in a word for ye, and so, Mr. Mannering, talking of astronomy, and spells, and these matters, have ye been so kind as to consider what we were speaking about last night? I begin to think, Mr. Bertram, with your worthy friend here, that I have been rather jesting with edge tools, and although neither you nor I, nor any sensible man, can put faith in the predictions of astrology, yet as it has sometimes happened that inquiries into futurity, undertaken in jest, have in their results produced serious and unpleasant effects both upon actions and characters, I really wish you would dispense with my replying to your question. 
It was easy to see that this evasive answer only rendered the laird's curiosity more uncontrollable. Mannering, however, was determined in his own mind not to expose the infant to the inconveniences which might have arisen from his being supposed the object of evil prediction. He therefore delivered the paper into Mr. Bertram's hand and requested him to keep it for five years with the seal unbroken until the month of November was expired. After that date had intervened, he left him at liberty to examine the writing, trusting that the first fatal period being then safely overpassed, no credit would be paid to its further contents. This Mr. Bertram was content to promise, and Mannering, to ensure his fidelity, hinted at misfortunes which would certainly take place if his injunctions were neglected. The rest of the day, which Mannering, by Mr. Bertram's invitation, spent at Elangowan, passed over without anything remarkable, and on the morning of that which followed, the traveller mounted his palfrey, bade a courteous adieu to his hospitable landlord, and to his clerical attendant, repeated his good wishes for the prosperity of the family, and then, turning his horse's head towards England, disappeared from the sight of the inmates of Elangowan. He must also disappear from that of our readers, for it is to another and later period of his life that the present narrative relates.